by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or uh, capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this, and then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to the 106th reading and study of the book Exploding the Israel Deception. We have gone a long way, we have gone a very long way, we are not yet at the end of the book, we will start today in chapter 10 of the book and I'm very much looking forward to it since um, we had a little pause for, I, I don't know, I think a week or something uh, where Tom and I couldn't get together. Tom and I got together today for the 106th reading here and for the moment you only hear me because I want to read something in the beginning that Tom even doesn't know even though I sent him an email he didn't have the time to open it up but I think that is something that makes a really really a little bit underestimated point because we, we cannot repeat this often enough. Uh, the book Exploding the Israel Deception and together with the End Time Deception uh, uh, book of Steve Wahlberg deals most and for all with the exposing, we expose, Steve Wahlberg expose, me, Jörg and Tom expose futurist teaching. And futurist teaching comes from the Roman Catholic Church and many people just do not know the Roman Catholic Church well enough. Many people read over the name Inquisition Update of, of Tom's ministry and don't have any idea what that stands for. Tom always said, and he can correct me later on if he uh, things that I do not uh, bring this well enough, but he said he called his ministry Inquisition Update because there's an Inquisition coming to America and the looks he, the people do not have seen. The Inquisition officially ended, officially, quote unquote, yeah? um, so called in Europe in 1806 or the roundabouts with the end of the Napoleonic Wars. That's what we are told, but that's not what is true. What really is true, I found today in a book that I want to share with you a little bit before we go into the actual reading. Um, I bought a book, and I'm going to send Tom a copy too, of a book that is called 
The Forging of Codex Sinaiticus. And this book is very important for every Bible-believing Christian to read and to understand, because here we are dealing with the counter-reformational Jesuit agenda to destroy the true word of God and the Textus Receptus, to destroy Protestantism, and to um, reinstall the kingdom of God on earth when you, of course, replace the word God with Pope. Yeah? Um, this is a very interesting book, and I'm going to read a little excerpt of that, and that actually has even nothing to do with Codex Sinaiticus. But I just want to give you, and here you have the cover of the book for the picture that you know how that looks like, and this Bill Cooper has nothing to do with the Bill Cooper that everybody knows in America, the radio host. Um, this book is very, very important, and it, it just sums up a little bit what the book is all about. That's why I want to read this to you. It says, next only to the King James Bible, and that is the preferred Bible of Tom and me, as you know. We, we always support the King James Bible, and especially the AV 1611 King James, not the 1769. But, um, you know, when you put a little water into it, then even the 1769, it is the King James, and that one is still better than 99.999% uh, of all the other Bibles out there. I don't even know one that is better than even that 1769 King James. Anyway, next only to the King James Bible, Codex Sinaiticus is by now perhaps the most famous, many would say infamous, book in the world. Its impact when it surfaced in the mid-19th century was immediate, and even today is powerful felt in the world of Bible scholarship. That is because it is pretended to represent a version of our Bible which is quite unlike the received text and is trumpeted abroad as representing the original text of the Bible before the Protestant Church and its bishops got their political hands on it, changing it into the Bible that we know today. It is also wrongly claimed to be the oldest and best manuscript of the Bible, representing a text to which all others, especially the received text, are to be referred. In other words, whenever Sinaiticus differs from the received text, which is shockingly often, then its reading are to be held superior to all other and preferred before them all. The impact of this upon Christian doctrine, and especially upon the question of the Bible's integrity and authority, has been immense, and it continues to shipwreck the faith of millions. So where did this strange book come from? Who wrote it, and why? And under what circumstances did they write it? These are all questions which we come to answer in the examination of the subject. Now, the last few days, I busied myself with starting to read that book. And as you know, I'm a very slow reader. <laughs> and I just got up today when I drove in the taxi to Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is called Pope Gregory XVI, The Jesuits and Codex Vaticanus. And that is a very interesting chapter. And there's a piece of that uh, of that chapter that I want to read to you and that is why I'm doing this long introduction long as it seems but listen now we are going to read from the top here just how it was operating under Antichrist Pope Gregory the 16th is made clear quote while the police harried the people in their daily lives the Inquisition collected the secrets of the confessional and launched its spiritual thunders on the unconforming. An edict is extended by the Inquisition General of Pesaro in 1841, commanding all people to inform against heretics, Jews, and sorcerers, those who have impeded the holy office or made satires against the Pope and clergy. In 1849, when Garibaldi took Rome, his soldiers opened the dungeons of the Palace of the Inquisition, and what greeted them was truly horrific. The times had changed, and being no longer able to burn the heretics and the excommunicated publicly, the Holy Office found means of putting them to death without shedding of blood of, uh, for the glory of God, by means of walling up and ovens. The walling up was of two kinds, the 
propria and impropria, or complete and incomplete. By the first, they punished dogmatists, by the second, the professors of witchcraft and sorcery. To punish the former, they made a niche in a wall, where standing upright on his feet they placed the condemned, binding him well to the wall with cords and chains, so that he could not move in the least. Then they began to build from the feet to the knees, and every day they raised the wall a course, at the same time giving the prisoner something to eat and drink. When he died, God knows with what agonies the wall was built up. But, dead or alive, it was closed in such a manner that no one could see where the niche had been and that the body remained there. The incomplete walling up, or enclosure, was made by sitting the condemned in a pit <coughs> um, was made by sitting the condemned in a pit, bound hand and foot, so that his head only was above ground. The pit was then filled up with quicklime, and moisture from the body, soon acting upon it, converted it into fire, and the miserable wretch was burned alive with the most frightful torture. They then invented ovens, or furnaces, which, being made red-hot, they lowered the condemned into them, bound hand and foot, and immediately closed over them the mouth of the furnace. This barbarous punishment was substituted for the burning pile, and in 1849 these furnaces at Rome were laid open to public view in the dungeons of the Holy Roman Inquisition, near the great church of the Vatican, still containing the calcined bones. This is all that I want to read from this book, and you maybe get an idea why I think this is a very important book for your own study to do. You can get it at Kindle version, you can get it at a printed version. I got it from a librarist in England who got it for me in two editions, and I'm going to send one to Tom. But the reason why I was saying that is we are exposing futurism of the Roman Catholic Church all the way in our study that we are doing here today now for the 106th time. But sometimes even we quote-unquote forget how cruel, how satanic, how bad, I'm even lost for words, the Roman Catholic Church actually is. The Inquisition is gone, doesn't exist anymore. You just read what happened in 1849, when it so-called ended in 1806. I read in other places that the Inquisition in Spain was even uh, still practiced during the whole time of Franco, the fascist leader of Spain, who ruled not only during the time of the Second World War, but died in 1976, and only then the Inquisition was ended. And Tom and I, we know that the Inquisition just shifted from what it was in the Middle Ages to, as you see, what it was here in the midst of the 19th century, to what it is today, world wars. And the burning of hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, I have to say, in, for example, Dresden during the Second World War, with Bomber Harris putting thousands of tons of bombs on a city filled with civilians and refugees. Hamburg, which was covered in a firestorm where at least 40 to 50,000 people died in one night, where they were just burning in the street, sinking into the asphalt. It's uh, incredible. And there are other books where you can read records of this. I, I, I just don't want to go too far, but I just wanted to remind everybody before we even go into the next part of Exploding the Israel Deception, which is a wonderful book by Steve Wahlberg, and don't take, anything, don't take anything away of that. I just want to remind the people of what the Roman Catholic Church is capable. You just heard it with this Inquisition. And even when you read it, I think you are reminded with the fiery furnace of Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
but I think now it is really time to welcome Tom Fress to the broadcast. Hello, brother. Hello, Yerk. It's wonderful to be here, and uh, I highly recommend the book, too. Uh, having not even read it, uh, so many of the modern Bible, Bible translations are translated from this phony uh, Roman Catholic document, uh, Codex Sinaiticus, and uh, the whole world wonders after the beast. And it's because we read the beast Bibles. And uh, it's, it's wonderful that you're exposing this. And uh, I hope the listeners will take the opportunity to get a copy of the book or at least listen to our reading and discussion of it when that comes about and uh, learn to appreciate the true word of God, the Texas Receptus, the preserved word of God for God's people in, uh, who speak English and uh, forsake all other Bibles. You know, we're not to have any other gods before him, and neither should we have any other Bibles before him. The King James Bible, the authorized version, is the preserved word of God for English-speaking people. It's the only Bible that interprets itself. You have no need that a man should teach you, because the authorized King James Version interprets itself. That's all I'll say about it for now. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Can you believe that I forgot to take the picture out of the computer of the King James? This is the Bible Tom speaks about. This is the Bible, most important. This is the Bible, the Reformation Bible. It is um, a sum up of Reformation Bibles that were before there. The Bishop's Bible, the Matthew's Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the um, um, uh, uh, Tyndale and what was the other guy? Uh, Wycliffe, uh, Wycliffe Bible. Um, there were other Bibles before, and they are all based, and that's the same, that's, that's the, the, the common ground they have. In the New Testament, they were all based on the Textus Receptus that was collected by Erasmus in the beginning of the 16th century. And even Erasmus was here and there fooled, uh, but that's subject for another version, for, for another reading, for another study. But the point is, as Tom said, I full heartedly agree. The King James Bible is the Bible today for English-speaking people. And one point where you can always recognize the truth is that it is persecuted on every level. And the more the King James Bible is attacked, the more you should turn to it and seek God's truth in his word in the King James Bible of 1611. So, let's go to our reading today. Chapter 10 of the book, Exploding the Israel Deception. I have a picture, of course, of the book right here. And we are going into When the River Euphrates Runs Dry. Tom will probably direct, make a little comment on this because he made one even before the broadcast. Um, do you want to make your comment right now, Tom, or do you want to get a little bit into the reading first? Well, we can get into the reading, but uh, the comment I have is very brief. If anybody is paying attention, they know that there's much, much, much talk on the Internet now about the Euphrates River drying up. It's currently drying up. And there's also reports all over the Internet of uh, voices of demons being heard from the dry riverbed and much, much, much baloney hype uh, being talked about on the Internet about this being the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, that the river Euphrates is going to be dried up to make way for the kings of the east to come and uh, instigate Armageddon. Just remember, Armageddon comes after the millennial reign of Christ. Do not be deceived. All the talk is a lie. Now, I'm not saying the drying up of the Euphrates River is a lie. That may well be the truth. They do and, that on uh, purpose. Yeah. 
Oh, certainly they have the capability. And uh, of course, this is what happened when when Babylon was overthrown. They diverted the water from the river Euphrates and dried up the river on the upstream side of Babylon and then marched the invading armies underneath the river gate. And that's how they that's how they. Uh, got into the city, the great walled city of Babylon, they simply used the dry riverbed to get to get into the city. The, the, the riverbed, the river ran right through the city and watered the city. And uh, they dried up the river to get in. And it's going to look to for all the world the, 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 uh, to the prophecy conference Yazoo's that this is uh, Bible prophecy being fulfilled, and they're being duped, and it's it's our commission to warn them that this is not the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This is the fulfillment of maybe the Pope's prophecy, because they would like to have you believe that for a thousand years the papacy has ruled and reigned in this world, and the millennial reign of Christ, or the vicar of Christ, is uh, nearing an end, and now it's time for the kings of the East to come and make war against the Holy Land. And uh, the whole world wanders after the beast, just like they always do, and it, it's time for us uh, at least to warn you about it. it it's all a lie. It's all a, a man-made uh, enactment of a of a, a, a true Bible prophecy, which is only spiritually discerned. And, and when the opportunity arises, Yerk and I will talk about that prophecy and, and give you some true biblical wisdom about that Bible prophecy so that you be not deceived. But here we are, be not deceived. All this talk about the current drying up of the river Euphrates and demons being heard in the riverbed and, and caves being exposed by the dry riverbed and, and all as a pretense for the fulfillment of the Bible prophecy of the kings of the east uh, crossing the river is just a whole load of wickedness. And uh, don't be a follower uh, of the liars. Back to you, Yerk. I agree full heartedly, Tom. Thank you very much for your wonderful words in this regard. Chapter 10 of Steve Wahlberg's book, Exploding the Israel Deception, When the River Euphrates Runs Dry. We have reached the heart of this book. On page 93 of 128, yeah, we are a little bit above half, but we are really coming to the epitome, and that is what he's going to say here. It is finally time to study the book of Revelation. As we open its sacred pages, we discover statements about, about Mount Zion in Revelation 14, verse 1, where it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. The twelve tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8, where the Bible reads, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Asa were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. As we open its sacred pages, we discover statements about Mount Zion, the twelve tribes of Israel, or Jerusalem, in chapter 21, verse 10, where it reads, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. 
we also discover statements about the temple in ch uh, chapter 11 of the book of Revelation, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. We also read statements about Sodom and Egypt, Revelation 11, verse 8. And that dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. <laughs> now, Tom, I have to go a little away from this book for just a second, just to add uh, this is something that we spoke about with Robert some time ago, and he all of a sudden made it so clear why um, this spiritual is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. <laughs> the point that that was outside of Jerusalem never even hit me before. <laughs> it's wonderful understanding that you get with true Bible study. Uh, you viewers, you are up for something if you keep on watching the videos of this channel, I can tell you, in the future. So it also has statements about uh, Babylon, verse, verse 5 of Revelation 17, where it reads, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Gog and Magog, Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, quote, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. The Euphrates River we read of in chapter 16, verse 12, where it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And Armageddon, chapter 16, verse 16, quote, And he gathered them together into a place, called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Thus, it is obvious that Revelation uses the terminology and geography of the Middle East in its prophecies. Yet, what is happening right now, all over earth, is that sincere evangelic scholars are applying most of these terms literally to those literal places and to the Jewish nation in the Middle East. Once again, here is the highly explosive question. Does God want these prophecies to be applied to the Israel in the flesh or to his Israel in the spirit? One example of such Middle East literalism is the following interpretation of Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. The Bible says, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. A popular Christian <laughs> I will even put this in quotation marks, a popular quote-unquote Christian magazine called End Time, and um, I have a picture of this, End Time magazine, let me just put this up, I didn't prepare the reading today, so, oops, I have to get that up, just looking for the title of the photo, and then I can show it to you here. I prepared this earlier. This is the end time, January, February 2013 edition. A popular Christian magazine called End Time um, comments, quote, You freight this river to be dried up. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, the Bible predicts that the Euphrates River will be dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east to invade Israel. This will happen at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. On January 13, 1990, the Indianapolis Star, uh, I also have a picture prepared for that, um, Indianapolis, should do the case, Indianapolis, should do the trick, yeah, Indianapolis Star, this is the picture of that. And by the way, here I said I could not find the mentioned article, so I did a search on the internet, um, I will put the link of the uh, end time 
Euphrates River War prophecy uh, up, but I, I couldn't find I couldn't find the article. If anyone finds the article, um, it would be nice if uh, he provided it or she provided it for us in a comment uh, beneath the video here in the comment section of the video. So on January 13th, 1990, the Indianapolis Star, which picture you see here on the right hand of the screen, carried the headline, quote, Turkey will cut off flow of Euphrates for one month, unquote. The article stated that the huge reservoir had been built by Turkey. While filling up the reservoir, the flow of the Euphrates would be stopped for one month and a concrete plug for a diversion channel built. These things have now been done. With this newly built dam, Turkey has the ability to stop the Euphrates River at will. The conditions for fulfilling this 1,900-year-old prophecy are now in place." Unquote. When the editors of End Time read about the Euphrates drying up, they apply this literally. End Time, this magazine here. The kings of the East are assumed to be China. When modern Turkey built a dam on the Euphrates River, they concluded that the soon that soon a massive Chinese army will be able to cross a dry riverbed in order to attack Israel at Armageddon. This is supposedly how Revelation chapter 16 verse 12 will be fulfilled. Yet, we cannot help but wonder, why would the Chinese ever launch such an army? And if they did attack Israel, why would they worry about crossing this river? Why not just send planes and drop bombs? Hasn't the Persian Gulf War taught us that ground armies don't accomplish much in this high-tech age of ours? We are about to learn from the Bible that such Middle East literalism actually fails to understand the true meaning and the genius of the Book of Revelation. It fails to discern that Revelation is simply using Old Testament terms, Old Testament history and Old Testament geography as symbols that are then meant to be applied spiritually and globally at the end of time. On August 9, 1945, the United States government finally decided to drop an atomic bomb called the Fat Man upon Nagasaki. It is now time to drop our version of the fat man upon the popular Middle East method of interpreting Bible prophecy. Revelation chapter 16 verse 12, again the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. In order to correctly understand this prophecy, we must first study some ancient Bible history about Israel and Babylon. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came unto Jerusalem and besieged it. That is what we read in Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. Jerusalem was conquered and Israel was taken captive for 70 years, as we can read in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. After those 70 years, an amazing set of circumstances occurred. The Euphrates was dried up, Babylon was conquered from the east, and Israel was delivered. As we shall soon see, this history forms the background for a true understanding of Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Ancient Babylon sat on the river Euphrates, and we can read that in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 51, verses 63 and 64, where we read, quote, and it, shall be with, uh, and it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, oops, sorry. And thou shalt say, thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary thus far, the words of Jeremiah. A wall surrounded the city. The river Euphrates ran through Babylon, just as Tom explained a few minutes ago, entering and exiting through two spiked gates whose bars reached down to the riverbed. 
When these double doors were shut and all other entrances were closed, Babylon was impregnable. Ancient Babylon was most proud, a golden cup that made all the earth drunken of her wine. We read therefore in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 32 and chapter 51 verse 7, quote, And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Babylon have been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. This reminds me very much, by the way, and I guess Tom will agree with me, uh, Revelation chapter 17, verse 2. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with the whore of Babylon, and the people and the world are made drunk with the wine of that fornication. That's right. Yet she was to fall and suddenly, and uh, yet she was to fall suddenly and be destroyed. Jeremiah 51:8, where it says, "Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain. If so, be she may be healed. If so, be she may be healed." Then God would call Israel, saying, "My people, go ye out of the midst of her." Jeremiah 51:45, which reads. My people, go ye out of the midst of her, and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. Now, as we shall soon see, this exact words are repeated in the book of Revelation to spiritual Israel about the importance of coming out of modern Babylon. Revelation chapter 17, verse 4 and 5, and Revelation chapter 18, verses 2 through 8. Now, Let's read it. The Bible says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And the Revelation 18, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The legacy, delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God, who judges her. In 538 BC, a little comment of mine here, isn't it strange that Babylon fell in 538 BC and the Antichrist rose for 1260 days or years in 538 AD according to Seventh-day Adventist teaching, which of course will be proven wrong in future studies. Did everybody ever stumble about 538 BC and 538 AD? What a quote-unquote convenient coincidence, eh, Tom? Yeah, certainly. In 538 BC, on the night of ancient Babylon's fall, 
her king and subjects were drunk with wine. Drunk of the wine, the same words in Daniel 5 and Revelation 18, remind you. So were the guards, and they forgot to fully close the double doors. Over 100 years earlier, God had predicted concerning Babylon and the Euphrates, quote, I will dry up the rivers, Isaiah 44, 27. That saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. The Lord also spoke about Cyrus, who conquered Babylon, saying, I will open before him the two levet gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Which we can read in Isaiah chapter, uh, what is this here? Because it is 95 is of course wrong. Uh, I, <laughs> so, 45. Huh? This is Isaiah 45, <coughs> so that's a printing error, 95. Isaiah 45 verse 1. It reads, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. And I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two levet gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Moreover, God called Cyrus my shepherd, and his anointed, in Isaiah 44, 28, and 45 verse 1, as we just read, but in 44 verse 8, we read, That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple, Thy foundation shall be laid. Thus Cyrus was a type of Jesus Christ, and he came from the east in Isaiah 46, 11, calling a ravenous bird from the east, that the man executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Inside the British Museum in London lies the famous Cyrus Cylinder. Okay, I have a picture of that too. <laughs> Let me just look this up. Uh, cylinder. <clears throat> this is the Cyrus Cylinder. Very interesting to have a look at. Let's enlarge this a little bit. You can see these are inscriptions. Yeah. That's what makes it so interesting. Inside the British Museum in London lies the famous Cyrus Cylinder. It describes how Cyrus, a general of Darius, conquered Babylon. Cyrus and his army dug trenches upstream alongside of the river Euphrates. By diverting the water, the river gradually went down as it ran through the city of Babylon. No one noticed. At night, at the height of Belshazzar's drunken feast, you remember the story about the hand writing on the wall, that feast? The water became low enough for Cyrus and his men to quietly slip under the double doors which had been left open. Quickly they overran the doomed city, killing the king in Daniel chapter 5 verse 30, and that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain and conquered Babylon. Then Cyrus issued a decree to let Israel go, as we can read in Ezra chapter 1. And I have the verses uh, up to verse 11 here, and I'm going to read this, Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. 
And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, besides the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites with them, uh, with all with all them whose spirit God raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his guards. Even those did Cyrus king of Persia bring forth, by the hand of Mithridath the treasurer, and numbered them to Shes uh, Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. All the vessels of gold and silver were five thousand and four hundred. All these did Shesbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Cyrus issued a decree to let Israel go, as we just read. The book of Revelation uses the events, geography, and terminology of the Old Testament, and then applies them universally to Jesus Christ, the Israel of God, and modern Babylon at the end of time. A failure to discern this principle has resulted in a massive misunderstanding of Revelation, a false Middle East focus, and deception. In Revelation chapter 17, a holy angel said to the Apostle John, I'm going to give the King James quote here, um, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. John saw this woman when he was in the spirit. Even so must we be in the spirit in order to understand this prophecy. Note this carefully. John saw a mystery Babylon who sitteth upon many waters. She also has a golden cup, just like we read in Jeremiah. Yet this mystery Babylon is not the same as the ancient city of Babylon in the Middle East. And the many waters that she sits upon certainly do not refer to the literal river Euphrates that today trickles through modern Iraq. No! Revelation's angel interpreter said in Revelation chapter 17 verse 15, And he said unto me, doesn't open quite well. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The genius of Revelation is that it uses the history of the Old Testament and then applies it spiritually to a mystery Babylon which now sits upon the many waters of a spiritual river Euphrates. Now I don't know if we can go any further than this part of the reading because this sentence is of the utmost
utmost importance. The genius of Revelation is that it uses the history of the Old Testament and then applies it spiritually to a mystery Babylon which now sits upon the many waters of a spiritual river Euphrates. If you have a forgerized Bible, you do not know the true history of the Old Testament. When you visit a school in this Antichrist system, you don't have true history of ancient times or Old Testamentical times. When you visit a university to study history, you do not study biblical, true history, but you study the history that Antichrist presents to you. The genius of Revelation to you is a closed book if you do not have the knowledge of true history in the Old Testament and then you cannot understand how it is spiritually meant into a mystery Babylon and you will run after everyone who writes an article about Oh, the river Euphrates is drying up and demons sitting there in what did Tom say? caves or something <laughs> yes do you see how important the sentence is do you see how important these studies are that we are doing for the 106th time in this book reading and which tom has done years and years and years in first amendment radio reading protestant books telling you of true biblical and happened history how important it is to have a real understanding of the true history because if you do not know the true history how can you understand the true prophecy meaning the book of revelation you can't and that's why so many people sit in front of the book of revelation and don't understand it they just don't get it now <laughs> let me make one point clear and i think tom will hammer on that as much as I do or even more Tom and I have been betrayed too we have not seen the book of Revelation the way that it was meant to be seen when John wrote it for us we have not understood the book of Revelation even not yet but we are going to enforce our studies on that we have not understood the book of Revelation as it was revealed to Jesus Christ by the Father and he gives it to his saints. It takes a lot and lot of study and most and for all people, it takes a lot of self-study. Not watching videos from corrupted channels and I don't know if we only speak of YouTube but channels everywhere all over the world. Channel, you know what channeling is? Yeah? think of that for a moment and watching history being taught or, 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 or Bible prophecy being taught to you from a pastor who has been educated in Jesuitical seminaries as all seminaries today are Jesuitically infiltrated and they do not teach biblical truth they do teach Jesuitical fantasy selling you that as truth and that closes the circle to what i was saying in the beginning why i was starting this reading with telling you about the book of codex sinaiticus and reading a part of the book of codex sinaiticus because let me assure you one thing if you busy yourself with the trolley of with the study of true history and with the true study of the true prophecy in the book of Revelation and you gain an understanding and you go out in the world and you warn people they will have a furnace ready for you please Tom continue well certainly by now the listeners are well aware that we've been giving up we've been given nothing but false information about the book of revelation and the version that we've gotten 
the interpretation of the book of Revelation as we've received it is supportive of uh, the, the, the foundational lie called futurism. Okay? Futurism is the underlying, the underpinning uh, falsehood upon which the modern interpretation of the book of Revelation is built. So almost nothing that we've read and heard about the book of Revelation is true because futurism isn't true. It's a diabolical lie. And, and listen, if you're just tuning in, let me show you what a lie futurism is. Futurism is based on the lie that the 70th week of Daniel has never been fulfilled. When in fact, the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Messiah, the Prince, Jesus, exactly like Daniel prophesied it in Daniel chapter 7, or Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. That predicts the very date of Christ's coming, his baptism in the River Jordan. That was when he was commissioned, he was, he was baptized, and he was uh, anointed to bring the gospel of salvation, the healing of the, of the, of the, the uh, separation of man from God. He was going to repair the damage that was done in the Garden of Eden. He was going to be our propitiatory sacrifice. And after three and a half years, in the midst of that seven-year period of time, he did exactly that. He became the Lamb of God and thereby caused all sacrifices and all oblations to cease by becoming the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if the sin of the world has been taken away, what use does God have for further sacrifices and oblations? Absolutely none. And more than that, if one performs a sacrifice or an oblation as a propitiatory sacrifice, he has effectively denounced and renounced and rejected the sacrifice, the all-sufficient, one-time, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin that Jesus gave. There's only one perfect way to reject the Lamb of God, as did all the, most of the Jews, and that is to continue making sacrifice. You know, not discerning the Lord's body, and what he accomplished on the cross, they eat and drink damnation to themselves. Okay? And those that make sacrifice, that is the Roman Catholic Church in the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass, they openly admit it's a sacrifice. They're the authors of futurism that says the 70th week of Daniel is not yet fulfilled which means literally that Messiah has not yet come. It is the church that rejects Jesus. I don't care how much they preach Jesus from the pulpits of their churches, they reject Jesus by making further sacrifice. It is the synagogue of Satan and it's visible all over the world every time they hold up that piece of bread and the little bell rings and the sacramental priest says, this is the body of Christ. And they break the bread and they call it a sacrifice. That is the centerpiece of the Roman Catholic Church. That is the center of their worship. Take away the mass, you've destroyed the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't exist any longer. It is the church of sacrifice. It is the most defining characteristic of the church of Antichrist that they make sacrifice, perfectly rejecting the bread of, of, of life in Jesus. And they're the ones who write all the false prophecies. 
that are built on a futurist delusion that says the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled yet in the future. It's never been fulfilled in the past, meaning Jesus was not the Christ. Okay, that's what they literally mean when they say the 70th week of Daniel is future. And now all they got to do is fulfill their version of the 70th week of Daniel. And that fulfillment is part and parcel, the very foundational uh, uh, aspect of this current drying up of the river Euphrates. It's all necessary in order to fulfill Rome's futurist 70th week of Daniel. And guess what they're going to present to the world in their future phony anti-Christ uh, 70th week of Daniel? A false Christ. Okay, this is like falling off a log. This is not difficult. Satan wants to counterfeit. First of all, Satan wants to deny that Jesus ever fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, thus getting the whole world to be drunk with the wine of Rome's fornication. Okay? Jesus is not out of the picture. Rome is all in all, and the whole world wonders after the beast. That's your fornication. Fornication in the Bible is also is always a method of of, of teaching false religion, false doctrine, false prophecies, false, false, false. And the whole world is drunk with the wine of Rome's fornication, false worship, false doctrine, false eschatology, false everything, false sacrifice, idolatry, the worship of every god, as as in is 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 now even clearly evident in their ecumenical movement. It the Roman Catholic Church is the epitome of error. It is as if Satan has taken on the form of the Roman Catholic Church and is showing through the Roman Catholic Church all of his Christ rejecting uh, uh, wares, all of his false ways. And uh, when this becomes apparent in your mind, you're going to understand what a delusion the world is steeped over its head in. You can't find a church hardly anywhere in the world that teaches the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel in Jesus. You can never find a single church in this world that teaches the historicist truth anymore. Now, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, historicism was the, the Protestant belief. So what a difference 500 years has made from truth to global delusion. You can't name a more dire circumstance for this world than the dire uh, ramifications of a global belief in futurism. And, and when, the whole, when the Bible says the whole world wonders after the beast, now it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because it's true. The whole world does wonder after the beast. It believes all that false doctrine. The whole world is drunk with the false doctrine, the false eschatology, the false scripture of the Roman Catholic Church, even her false Bibles. They all carry one of her false Bibles, and most of them are translated from the, from the Sinaiticus Codex that Yerk talked about earlier. I hope and pray but with almighty God as my witness, I hope and pray that this message is finding fertile soil in the, in the minds and the hearts and the spirits of the listeners. That the whole world wanders after the beast 
And it's most highly likely that you also, if not now, have for all your life been drunk with the wine of this fornication as I was. I am not one whit better than the worst of the worst. I believe futurism, hook, line, and sinker. I was taught it from cradle to nearly my grave. And only by the mercy of Almighty God was I brought out of that delusion. And now I'm understanding the historicist truth, like York and, and, and like Steve Wolberg and many others that are now waking up to the truth. And time is critical. Understand this, that the best that could be expected of a, of a human, is of a man, is to live three score and 10 years, 70 years. In the scope of the delusion of futurism, that's not enough time to come out of that delusion. Time is of the essence, and we work our spiritual fingers to the bone to research the truth and bring it to the listeners as simply as we can so that every every heart can understand it so that every question can be asked and every question can be answered and uh i thank god for steve Wolberg. Uh, you know we have our differences but but this book is valuable and our commentary about it is valuable. And uh, I, I congratulate Yerk for uh, seeing the challenge of this book and accept the, the reading and discussion of it for his listeners and mine. And I, I, I just, I just hope and pray the spirit of almighty God prick the consciences and open the minds of God's listeners today.